August 2004, 200 women armed with knives, stones, and chili powder descended on Aku Yadav, the monster who assaulted and killed their loved ones. He bled to death from 70 wounds. Some of these were inflicted by Anjabai Borkar. These are some moms who took revenge on child molesters. Marianne Bachmeier 1981, a shocking scene unfolded in a German courtroom. Marianne Bachmeier, 31 years old, pulled out a pistol and fired eight shots at Klaus Grabowski, the man who had molested and killed her daughter Anna. Marianne's act of vengeance made headlines around the world, sparking a heated debate about justice and morality. But who was Bachmeier, and what drove her to take justice into her own hands? Marianne's life was marked by tragedy and trauma. Being a victim of sexual assault herself, she had given up one child for adoption as a teenager. Shortly after, she was assaulted again before giving birth to her second child, whom she also placed for adoption. But when she finally had her third child, Anna, Marianne was determined to keep this one. For a while, the two lived a happy life in West Germany, where Marianne ran a pub in Lübeck. But on one fateful day, everything changed. May 5th, 1980, following a heated argument with her mom, Anna decided to skip school, which would set off a chain of events that would shatter both their lives. Anna was kidnapped by Klaus Grabowski, their 35-year-old neighbor who had a criminal record involving child molestation. Grabowski kept Anna at his home for hours before finally strangling her with his fiancé's pantyhose. He then hid the body in a cardboard box and left it on the bank of a nearby canal. Grabowski's fiancé grew suspicious and told the police that same evening, leading to his arrest. While he confessed to the murder, he denied any sexual abuse toward Anna. Instead, Grabowski provided this strange and appalling story. He said he strangled Anna because she tried to blackmail him. Grabowski claimed she tried to seduce him and then threatened to tell her mom that he had molested her if he didn't give her money. Marianne was furious when she heard this story. A year later, when Grabowski went to trial for the murder, she finally sought revenge because her daughter's legacy couldn't be tarnished. March 6, 1981 on the third day of the trial, at around 10 a.m., Bachmeier smuggled a Beretta 70 in the Lübeck District Court and fatally shot Grabowski. She aimed at his back and fired seven times. Six hit him, which killed him almost instantly. Bachmeier then lowered her gun and was apprehended without resistance. Witnesses claim that Marianne made incriminating remarks after shooting Grabowski. According to Judge Gunther Kroger, who spoke to her after she shot him, she heard the grieving mother say, I wanted to kill him. Marianne allegedly continued, He killed my daughter. I wanted to shoot him in the face, but I shot him in the back. I hope he's dead. Two policemen would hear her call Grabowski a pig after shooting him. And so, not long after, the grieving mother found herself standing trial. Now, during that trial, Marianne testified that she had dreamt of shooting this man. A doctor who examined her asked for a handwriting sample, to which Marianne responded by writing, I did it for you, Anna, and put seven little hearts there, possibly symbolizing each year of her daughter's life. Marianne explained that she heard Grabowski's allegations about her daughter attempting to blackmail him. She said, I thought now comes the next lie about this victim who was my child. Two years after the murder, the court finally found Marianne guilty of premeditated manslaughter, giving her six years in prison. However, Marianne was released after serving only half of her sentence. September 17, 1996, Marianne passed away at the age of 46. She was laid to rest next to her daughter, Anna. Surprisingly, Marianne wasn't the only mom who chose to seek revenge in a courtroom. Ellie Nestler April 2, 1993, Ellie Nestler confronted Daniel Mark Driver, a Christian camp employee who molested her son, Willie, in the courtroom of the Jamestown Justice Court. She ended up shooting him multiple times in the head and neck. Born into a poor family in the rural town of Jamestown, California, Nestler was the eldest of three daughters. As a youngster, she drove a tractor for the local cattle ranchers, dug ditches, installed irrigation pipes, and worked on cars. Married and divorced early, she met Bill Nestler, a gold miner and crop duster. The couple married, had their son Willie, and quickly moved to the new gold rush country, Liberia to seek their fortune. 
While over there in the West African country, Ellie gave birth to her daughter, but returned home with her children when civil war broke out. After returning to Tulum County, she struggled financially and got by on welfare checks and chopping wood. But her life was about to take another drastic turn. Family members noticed that young Willie was acting strangely after visiting a summer camp where Daniel Mark Driver worked as a dishwasher. During a sleepover at his aunt's house some months later, Willie confided that Driver had done what he termed nasty things to him. 1989, Driver was arrested in Palo Alto for theft and was returned to Tulum County to face charges in the station of Nestler's son and three other boys. During the trial, it was revealed that years earlier, Driver had pled guilty to multiple counts of sex with minors in the San Jose area, but had been given probation after the judge in the case received numerous letters from members of Driver's church vouching for his character. 1994, Ellie Nestler didn't want to make her son testify in court because she knew it was going to be hard for him, and so she decided to eliminate Daniel Driver once and for all. She ended up shooting him five times in the head inside the courtroom, using a 25 caliber pistol. During an interview, Nesler stated that she had mixed feelings about the shooting, saying, I am sorry that I killed someone and that I'm not with my children, but on the other hand, I wish the judicial system would have taken care of it. I wish I wouldn't have had to. Despite reportedly admitting to state investigators that she had contemplated killing Driver for over two years before the shooting, Nestler pled not guilty by reason of insanity. Eventually, she was convicted on a lesser charge of voluntary manslaughter. She received a 10-year prison sentence, but her conviction was overturned on appeal due to juror misconduct. As a result, she was released after serving only three years. However, the family's troubles with the law were far from over. 2001, the Nestler family made headlines once again. Ellie was arrested for selling and possession of meth, and she pled guilty. The following year, the judge gave her six more years in prison. While Ellie was serving her time, 23-year-old Willie was having troubles of his own. 2004, Willie stomped a man to death in a fit of rage and is now serving 28 to life for murder in the first degree. June 2006, finally free from jail, Ellie was unable to visit her son Willie because she was in the final stages of a long battle with breast cancer. She was 56 years old when she died two years later. Now this next mom didn't kill her child's monster, but she definitely took revenge a little too far. Bonita Lynn Vela December 2013, Bonita Vela, a then 35-year-old mom from Franklin, Indiana, sliced into a man's genitals with a box cutter after accusing him of molesting her son. Police say Vila and two others held the man against his will for nearly three hours Saturday, threatening to either kill him. Vela had been at a friend's house when she'd been smoking weed. However, at around 3 a.m., she became angry and demanded that one of her friends retrieve her daughter's boyfriend. She believed he had sexually assaulted her son, and she was determined to make him pay. Vela's friends thought that she looked mad, but they obeyed her anyway and held the boyfriend down as Vela threatened him. She kept telling him that she would ask her friends to take him out with guns by tying him to a tree, shooting him in the head, and leaving his body to be eaten by animals. As the confrontation went on, she got increasingly mad, shouting at him and forcing him to admit to abusing her son while he begged them not to call the police. This agitated Vela even more, thinking he definitely had something to hide. Vela had given him an ultimatum, allow her to cut his genitals or be killed. She later told police that, I wanted to scar him so that he would have to look at it every time that he had sex in the future. The boyfriend had no choice but to allow her to cut him, as he thought the trio would go to great lengths to hurt or kill him. Vela would take out that box cutter, give it a couple clicks, and slice into his genitals, leaving him with a deep cut while one of her friends filmed the incident. After the gruesome act was over, one of Vela's friends called 911, and the boyfriend was taken to the hospital to be treated for those injuries, while Vela was arrested and charged with criminal confinement with a deadly weapon and battery with a deadly weapon. 
Vela told the investigators that she only meant to scare the young man and never intended to hurt him. The boyfriend's name wasn't released to the public due to his young age, and Vela never pressed any charges against him. She later made a deal with prosecutors to avoid jail time. She pled guilty in exchange for a plea agreement, resulting in a 16-month sentence. During that time, Vela served 10 months under home detention with GPS monitoring, followed by six months on probation. She also attended anger management counseling. Tammy Lee Gibson June 16, 2008 Tammy Lee, a mother from Tacoma, Washington, beat up her neighbor, a sex offender standing at 7 foot 3 with an aluminum baseball bat. After getting arrested, Gibson said that she only had one regret. She wished she had done more damage. No, I'd do it again, if not better. I don't care if it hurts me. I don't regret it. It got him away from my kids and all the other kids in the neighborhood. According to police documents, sex offender William Baldwin had moved into his uncle's house in Tacoma in early June. Following that move, county deputies distributed flyers around the neighborhood to alert residents of his presence. The police mentioned in that flyer that he was a level 3 sex offender and considered a high risk to reoffend. When Gibson saw that flyer, all she saw was red. She picked up that aluminum bat and headed straight to where Baldwin was staying. She knocked on his door, but nobody answered. So she walked up and down the street asking neighbors if they'd seen him. She then found Baldwin behind his trailer and told him she was going to kill him because Baldwin had molested her children. Before Baldwin could say anything, she started beating on him, leaving him with an injured arm. Contrary to what she had said to Baldwin, Gibson later told investigators that he had not molested her children. But she did say that she recognized him from the flyer as an acquaintance who had talked to her 10-year-old daughter last summer. For him to be right there in front of my house and talking to my child made me crazy. The attack landed both in jail. Gibson for second-degree assault and felony harassment and Baldwin for failing to register at his most recent address. People around the neighborhood believed Gibson was a hero and they demanded that she'd be released. However, the authorities didn't see it that way. Sheriff's spokesman Ed Troyer said that despite Baldwin's criminal record, we can't have people randomly beating up registered sex offenders. He continued, This isn't a soccer mom in a minivan. She has had no less than a dozen arrests over the last few years for assault, drugs, driving crimes, you name it. Tammy Gibson was charged with second-degree assault and felony harassment. January 2009, she pled guilty to a reduced charge of third-degree assault and was sentenced to three months in jail. Lakeisha Richmond August 18, 2012 A mother of two out of Memphis, Tennessee beat her son's Little League coach with a baseball bat over claims that he molested him. Richmond said she launched her attack after her boys told her that they had been groped by their football coach, Tony Massey. She later told the police that she had asked her sons, did he touch you bad down there? Her son said yes, and also told her that he had done it to many other boys, not just them. At first, Richmond said that she tried to do the right thing by reporting him to the police. However, she flew in a rage and couldn't contain herself when she saw him at her son's football practice. Taking the law into her own hands, Richmond grabbed a bat from the trunk of her car and started chasing Massey. When she caught up with him, she just beat him repeatedly with that bat as he begged for her to stop. Massey was later found shirtless and bleeding from the head and face by police officers and was rushed to the hospital. Lakeisha Richmond with a huge grin in her mugshot. But she later did show remorse for what she did, saying, I didn't intend to do whatever I did to him. I apologize. But I don't apologize for what happens to my kids. She continued, during the beating, he was saying he didn't do it and that he was sorry. If you didn't do it, then why are you saying you're sorry? What are you sorry for? Lakeisha was charged with aggravated assault. She spent a few days in jail, but was later released. As for Tony Massey here, his apartment was searched by police, but nothing was found. And he hasn't been charged with any crime. Lori Palmer Fall of 2000, Lori Palmer learned that Scott Phillips, a man she considered a close friend, had molested her daughter. 
At that time, Lori had hung up her badge and gun after a long and fulfilling career in the Wichita Police Department, where she had served in various units, including the Investigations Division. But even in retirement, she wasn't someone to mess with and was ready to handle any trouble that came her way. Palmer had reasons to believe that Phillips was a pedophile and that he was actively carrying out his evil deeds. What's more concerning was that he had two daughters of his own, and she believed he was a danger even to them. Armed with nothing but her rage, Palmer went to Phillips' workplace and, before he knew anything was wrong, she managed to convince him to go for a drive. By all accounts, it was a wild ride, a high-speed interrogation at about 80 miles an hour, ending in a remote field 20 minutes out of town, where Palmer, an ex-cop, started issuing orders. She told him to take off his clothes, and then she demanded answers. In response, a cold and naked Phillips confessed to fondling her daughter. Palmer was satisfied. As an ex-cop, she knew that with a confession, she'd probably get him taken off the streets. She was right. Phillips was arrested and charged with sexual assault after he repeated that confession to the police. But he wasn't the only one that was put in handcuffs that day. Palmer was also arrested and charged with kidnapping, with intent to commit first-degree murder. After Palmer's arrest, District Attorney Nola Falston called the ex-cop's action a vigilante rage-filled, anger-filled pursuit of an individual. But she knew not everyone would see Palmer as a criminal. Looking at this as any citizen would, somebody would say, well, you know, you go girl. You take that child buster out to the country, strip him down naked and get a confession from him. That's great, but that's not the law. However, Palmer remained steadfast in her decision, saying that she simply acted as any concerned parent would. She also said she felt a hit in the gut because she considered him a close friend. Palmer had been best friends with Philip's wife, Kayleen, since childhood and had been maid of honor at their wedding years ago. Palmer's daughter, Eden, frequently slept at the Phillips residence when Palmer worked nights. So when Kayleen told her Scott was having explicit conversations with a young girl on the internet, Palmer became concerned and feared that Phillips might have done something to her daughter. In a conversation every mother dreads, Eden told Palmer that Phillips had sexually assaulted her several times. Outraged, Palmer asked to meet Kayleen and told her, Well, I wasn't going to tell you. I was just going to kill him. And then you could have the insurance money and I would feel better and we'd be done with it. Yet as an ex-cop, Palmer initially tried to do the right thing by going to the police. Unfortunately, they only added to her mounting frustration as they told her to make a report and wait for him to do something. But Palmer was in no mood to wait. She left the police station and within an hour picked up Phillips on her own and got that confession out of him. Later, she defended her action by saying, I just found out that my daughter had been hurt. The people that I counted on to help me weren't going to help me. And there were going to be more kids hurt if something didn't happen and happen soon. Now, before his trial, Phillips got out of jail on $50,000 bail. But Palmer stayed behind bars because her bail was set at five times that of Phillips, a quarter of a million dollars. Palmer's bail was eventually reduced, and she was placed under house arrest until her trial. If she would have been found guilty, she would have spent at least five years in prison. But fortunately for her, after three months of house arrest, Palmer's kidnapping charges were dropped, and she pled guilty to lesser charges, including making a criminal threat. For that, she received 12 months probation. On the other hand, Phillips pled guilty to a reduced charge of felony fondling and was given a four-year sentence. In the end, Palmer admits that what she did was against the law. Nevertheless, she still asks, how many kids do we have to sacrifice to the rule of law? And this brings us to our next mother, who also decided the law wasn't enough and got rid of her son's muster for good. Sarah Sands. This is 32-year-old Sarah Sands. In a few moments' time, she will stab a man to death with a knife that she is carrying underneath her clothing. November 2014, Sarah armed herself with a knife and she stabbed Michael Pleistead eight times after her sons told her that he had sexually abused him. This pedophile living in the block of apartments that neighbored the family's duplex in Canning Town, East London, had previously been convicted for several child abuse offenses. 
Robin Moult had served time in prison for his heinous crimes, but after he got out, he changed his name to conceal his past and managed to become a well-known community figure who ran a brick and brack shop. This is why Sarah saw no reason not to trust her 77-year-old neighbor, whom she treated like a father. She would enjoy chatting and cooking meals with him and thought it'd be a good way for one of her sons to earn some money when police that had offered the young boy a job in his shop. But everything would change when she discovered his dark past. She learned that he had been accused of molesting two boys and was on bail awaiting trial. Police were investigating a further allegation that he even abused a third boy. After more digging, Sarah also discovered Pleistead's real name, Robin Moult, and this led her to uncover his previous crimes, which were a string of convictions for assaulting boys between 1970 and 1991. Sarah was naturally terrified that he had harmed her sons. However, when she asked him if anything had happened, he denied it. Sarah didn't believe him and she decided to ask her sons if Pleistead had done anything to him. November 28, 2014, after talking to her sons, the youngest broke down and admitted that he had been sexually abused by Pleistead. Sarah was horrified and decided to confront this man, but she ended up stabbing him eight times and watched him as he bled to death. After realizing what she had done, she had called the police and turned herself in. She was given manslaughter on the basis of losing control. At her trial, Sarah would sob in the witness box, insisting that she had not meant to hurt Pleistead when she went to his apartment that night. But she had drunk a bottle of brandy and was only seeing red. She told the jurors that she had tried to reason with him and get him to admit to his crimes to spare his victims the trauma of having to go to court and recount everything he had done to him. But when Pleistead ignored that request and smirked, telling her the boys were all liars who had ruined his life, well, she snapped and ended up killing him. Sarah was eventually sentenced to three and a half years in prison. However, that sentence was later increased to seven and a half years by the Court of Appeal judges in London, who deemed her initial sentence to have been too lenient. 2018, Sarah was released after serving nearly four years in jail and is now campaigning for a tightening of the rules on sex offenders being allowed to change their names. In an interview, she stated, I did what any mother would do, because he did this to my son, my little boy. I never dreamt I'd be capable. I have no pride in it, but at least I know he can't hurt anyone else. Kimberly Cunningham October 2003 Kimberly's world unraveled when she discovered that her longtime friend and her sister's husband, Coy Hunley, had molested two of her children. Fueled by a mix of anger, grief, and a mother's protective instinct, Kimberly confronted Hunley in a deadly encounter that would change her life forever. Now what happened and why? August 2003, before everything turned upside down, Kimberly had obtained a gun permit, taken lessons at a firing range, and carried a loaded gun in her black purse in the car ever since she learned that Hunley's eldest son had allegedly molested her son Shane. After Kimberly reported this to the police, his father, Coy Hunley, threatened her. Feeling helpless and angry, she smashed the windows to his son's car. When she called Hunley at work, he told her the vandalism made the two families even. Things calmed down a little bit after the incident, but little did Kimberly know that her daughter, Amanda, was hiding an even darker secret. Kimberly began to notice that her daughter, who was a straight-A student, had become listless and withdrawn. Amanda would lie on the floor outside her bedroom door, screaming and crying until her mother would come in and sleep in bed with her. Kimberly continued to press Amanda, but Amanda couldn't seem to bring herself to tell her mother everything. Now one night, while Kimberly was putting Shane to bed, Amanda had asked her to come into her bedroom. She said that she had something she wanted to talk about, and that's when she told her mother all about what Coy Hunley was doing to her. Finally, it would all make sense to Kimberly, and she made up her mind immediately. Coy Hunley had to pay. October 7th, 2003, after Amanda left for school, Kimberly got into her car and drove to the tool company where Hunley worked. She called him out into the parking lot, and as she was waiting for him, she was praying that he would deny the assault. But instead, Hunley laughed at her. 
Driven by anger, Kimberly shot him five times, reloaded the weapon, and fired five more rounds. By the time little Amanda got to school, Hundley laid that in the parking lot, with four bullets in his head and four more scattered throughout his body. Witnesses said that after she had shot him, she got back into her car and calmly drove away. 45 minutes later, she was at the Alcoa, Tennessee Police Department turning herself in. October 2005, the jury acquitted Kimberly of second-degree murder, but found her guilty of voluntary manslaughter. She was given four years in prison, but it was reduced to six months on appeal. Maria del Carmen Garcia June 13, 2005 Maria was waiting for the bus in Venejuzar, Spain. It was a pretty regular day, until the man who had molested her daughter unexpectedly ran into her, he even dared to ask her, How's your daughter? The anger inside Garcia was so intense that she couldn't find the words to respond. However, that night she decided to confront them in a way that no one saw coming. October 17, 1998 Everything would start when Garcia asked her daughter, Veronica, to go buy some bread. It was then that her neighbor, Antonio Cosme, approached Veronica, grabbed her by the shirt, put a knife to her neck, and forcibly took her to a nearby forest. It was there that he sexually assaulted her. Two years go by, and Antonio was sentenced to nine years in prison. On the day that he met Garcia, he decided to try his luck by going to the city, thanks to a prison permit. He had thought about having a drink, meeting up with his friends, and then going back to the prison. However, this never happened. Garcia made sure of that. As Cosme walked into a local bar, Garcia made a change of plans, redirecting toward her house. Here she would grab some matches and a plastic bottle, and then head by to a nearby gas pump, fill that bottle up with fuel, before making her way to where Cosme was. Meanwhile, at the bar, Cosme was talking and drinking with another person. When Garcia walked in, the owner had sensed something was off and stood in her way. She assured him that she was there to do nothing but talk. Before he could respond, she shoved him to the side and continued to her target. In the blink of an eye, she took out that bottle and began spraying gasoline all over his head, yelling, So you don't forget me. She then threw the match at him and watched this man burn in flames. While everybody was watching a scene out of Tarantino's playbook, she ran out of the bar, but was later arrested that same night, as she made no effort to hide from the police. One week after the incident, Antonio Cosme died due to the severity of the burns, which affected about 60% of his body. As a result, Maria was charged with murder. At the trial, she would plead temporary insanity. Nonetheless, though, she was sentenced to nine and a half years in prison by the provincial court. But the Supreme Court later reduced that sentence to five and a half years on appeal. Anjabai Borkar August 2004, hundreds of women marched from a slum called Kasturba Nagar in India to the local courthouse to witness the trial of Aku Yadav, a brutal gangster, rapist, and serial killer. Yadav showed up as expected, walking into this courtroom, confident and unrepentant but he would never make it out alive. Yadav was lynched by a mob of 200 women. This man was stabbed 70 times, and chili powder and stones were thrown in his face. One of these women was Anjabai Borkar, the mother of one of his victims. For several years, Aku Yadav had made the lives of people in this slum a living nightmare. The fear was so intense that children stopped going to school, and women were too scared to leave their homes. One young woman, Asha, was seen as a threat by Yadav. Now she was one of the few brave women who would dare confront him about his crimes. This made Yadav view her as this obstacle that needed to be eliminated. Her mother used to warn her not to engage with him, but she used to say, If my death is destined in his hands, I'll die. But what about all the people he's looting and the women he's assaulting? Can't we unite to kill him? True to her words, Asha did try to kill Yadav, but she failed. After this, Yadav's determination to get rid of her only grew stronger. June 8, 1999, Yadav sought revenge by sexually assaulting her, and then brutally murdering and dismembering her body in front of her daughter, Mega. Fearing for her life as the sole witness to her mom's murder, Mega sought refuge with her grandma, 
on Jean Baiborgar. However, Yadav's audacity knew no bounds. One day, he stormed into their house with a group of five people. The grandmother managed to hide Mega behind a large drum, but Yadav grew suspicious when he noticed an extra lunch being served. He demanded to know who it was for and where Mega was hiding. From that moment on, the family lived in constant fear. Yadav kept a close watch on him, frequently going to the house to warn Mega against testifying against them. Despite managing to make it to court, Mega was too traumatized to testify, resulting in Yadav receiving a lenient sentence of just 16 months in jail due to the lack of eyewitness testimony. Something big happened that changed everything. Yadav tried to force his way into Usha Nadayani's house because she had helped a woman file a case against him for violating her. Late at night, he and his gang had surrounded Usha's home, demanding to be let in. But Usha decided she wasn't going down without a fight. She grabbed a cooking gas cylinder, opened the valve, and threatened to set herself and everyone nearby on fire. So Yadav and his gang quickly backed off. This incident gave the people of Kasturba Nagar the courage they needed to stand up against this evil person. Usha even went door to door, rallying everyone to join forces and bring Yadav down. And finally, they listened. People left their jobs, pooled their savings, and were determined to take him down. Before long, the streets were filled with angry people with sticks and stones. The women he sexually assaulted also marched, celebrating their newfound power. They went straight to Yadav's house and set it on fire. This man was so scared for his life, he sought protection from the police, and they arrested him for his own safety. August 13th, 2004, Yadav was due to appear in court, and the people who sought revenge were ready to see justice served. On that fateful day, a furious mob of approximately 200 women armed themselves with knives, stones, broken glass, and chili powder. This man had no idea what he was about to face. He laughed and mocked the women when he saw him in the courtroom. But that laughter soon died out when the women, united in their rage, stormed at him. They only backed off when they made sure he wasn't breathing. Following the incident, four women, including a pregnant one, were initially released. However, the arrest sparked a massive protest outside the police station, with hundreds of women demanding their release. Eventually, the police gave in to the pressure. However, they did make an unusual trade to the women of the community. Give us any five old women. Among the five old women who surrendered was Borkar. She was one of the women who had stabbed Yadav and who felt that they should be arrested instead of their daughters. In 2014, the case against the women, including Anjabai, was dismissed due to inconclusive evidence. 